uh, webinar, we will see and discuss how talent can support uh, data governance initiatives within uh, financial institutions. So let's start the webinar. Okay, so to start with, first basically we have a different uh, use cases uh, within the BFS industry, right? So if you see on the slides, there are a lot of uh, processes from your sales and service, from your core processes like bank back office, as well as risk management, corporate operations and quality and governance, right? And within these processes, there are a lot of BUs which are involved. So for example, you have your core processes uh, in which you have your CASA systems, you have CRM, as well as contact history of your customers. And on top of that, for risk management, you basically may be managing your risk across financial risk modeling, as well as to understand and analyze your marketed risk, right? As well as liquidity risk. So these are some of the requirements that have come from a different business processes. Now, from the uh, business standpoint, you have a lot of end users as well as consumer of these applications, right? From your CEOs to your end users to your customer care. And the ask of these different user personas is basically to have different use cases across these different business processes. Right? So in this, you can see in terms of consuming this information, you have different business outcomes from analytics to advanced analytics as well as governance. And each and every uh, section, you have different use cases. So for example, in case of analytics, you would like to basically create different financial reports for your monthly, weekly, or daily reporting. And on top of that, you may also want to understand the attributes or the customer behavior where you would like to create customer 360 degree kind of a use case to consolidate all the customer data into some centralized repository and build different analytic use cases on top of it. And in addition to that, you will also like to run a lot of machine learning models to perform churn or customer retention kind of a use cases as well as to uh, reduce the risk and fraud detection uh, kind of a requirements. Right? Now, to achieve these different business outcomes with respect to the use cases, you may have different architecture solutions. So uh, we traditionally, we have seen different architectures starting from your direct reporting, where you have your traditional ODS systems as well as staging systems to capture all your transactional banking data and create different financial reports on top of the data warehouse. Now, subsequently, in the year 2000, we have different modeling techniques that were introduced from data marts to data vault. And in top of, on top of that, in the latest uh, couple of years back, we introduced a different uh, uh, strategies in terms of architecture, which is data lake. So data lake is nothing but a different uh, layer of zones where you basically capture the data from multiple systems and uh, consolidate the data into one centralized repository. And on top of that, a lot of uh, customers uh, or banks, they also would like to create their data warehouse as well as data lakes on a cloud application. So these are some of the use cases that pertains to a BFSI industry. Now, when it comes to talent, right? So there are a lot of challenges when you see the different use cases that you want to build. So to start with, for a specific business unit, right? Within a banking environment, you may have a one business requirement, right? And for that particular business requirement, you may be having to run different projects to basically analyze or to capture the data of your customer or to create financial reporting. Or if you want to do some sort of retail analysis, right? And to, to create those different projects, there is a lot of dependency on different data points. So for example, for project one, you maybe want to get the data from different uh, customers. Or in the second use case, you also want to introduce and collaborate the data from your social media to build use cases for customer churn or customer segmentation. Or if you want to uh, recommend a specific product to your end customers. Right? And again, to acquire all these source systems, you maybe have to connect to different source systems. So source one, source two, source three, and source four. And this is basically coming from one business vertical. Just imagine if you have different business verticals and each and every business vertical have multiple projects running on in parallel, right? So in, 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 to solve that challenges, you may have to connect to different endpoints, right? 
because of all these uh, different requirements of project silos, you may uh, be having or using different tools. So for example, in case of business use case one, you may be using tool one to collect the data as well as to perform data quality operations in terms of governing the data from data curation to data access. And on top of that, let's say if you have a different business requirement and a different multiple projects, then for all those set of projects, you may be using different uh, tools. So for example, if you have a governance initiative within a bank, you may be using a governance specific uh, tool. And on top of that, if you have a data quality, which is again an intrinsic part of your governance strategy, you may be using a different data quality tool, right? So if you have multiple tools to solve different and multiple requirements, then there are a lot of challenges. And because of those challenges, there are a lot of pitfalls that we have seen in the industry. So coming back to the pitfalls, so in this case, in terms of connectors, right? So most of the cases, different tools will have different set of connectors, right? And even in terms of integrating to different endpoints, they have some limitation. And on top of that, uh, these tools basically will charge you based on the number of connectors as well as the number of environments, right? And uh, as the data size grows uh, over a period of time, the tool will also have a different licensing model to charge based on the data growth. Right? Uh, portability is again a very important aspect of it because if you are creating some specific use case for a specific uh, project uh, using a tool one, then those particular set of codes will not be able to port to a different tool automatically, right? So that means you will have to again rewrite those pieces of codes inside a New, uh, new tool. So this uh, avoids or this basically uh, uh, restricts the users to collaborate between different projects using different tools. So similarly, uh, you can see we have different pitfalls that comes or that arises because of the usage of multiple tools within a enterprise, right? Now, let's see how the chaos compounds at in every level of the company, right? So in this case, what happens is, uh, what are the foundational challenges that organization uh, faces to implement a workable data governance as well as risk if these challenges are not addressed? So the basis of the challenge for many organizations is an overwhelming data environment and the chaos that happens if they don't or can't address those challenges. Uh, data chaos typically uh, emerges as data volume uh, grows uh, much faster than our ability to harness it. Uh, and the range of the data source within BFSI industry have typically increased fivefold uh, within last couple of years. Uh, data, uh, in data uh, age 2025 report for Seagate, uh, IDC forecast that the global data sphere will reach 175 zettabytes by 2025. Uh, and this is a bigger number that we can reasonably comprehend. So, how can we begin to imagine how to harness and protect such vast amount of data so that it trustworthy and easily accessible? To compound the data challenge, there is also an efficiency gap. The number of people uh, with uh, data in their title has, has increased significantly over the last decade. So for example, from CDOs to data scientists and data stewards, new data-driven jobs keep emerging with increased dependency on new enterprise resources. Uh, in parallel, the time spent by these same people looking for the right data to achieve a given task is dis disproportionately very high. Uh, these foundational issues essentially represent a liability for the whole company if not addressed in a timely manner. Uh, it is widely regarded that around 45% of data transformation projects fail within most companies struggling on execution of the data and efficiency challenges mentioned in the previous slides, okay? Now, with regulations is everywhere and it's a mess to manage the regulations, okay? Uh, in parallel, the regulatory process didn't slow down as well. Uh, regulators have all stepped into start regulating the data market and protect citizens' data privacy while serving companies' benefits. By doing so, uh, they definitely uh, added extra layers of complexity and the number of regulation is just multiplying. Uh, Gartner predicts that by 2023, 
a 65% of the world's population uh, will have its personal data covered under modern privacy regulations uh, up from 10% in 2020. Uh, in terms of regulatory compliance, uh, EU was the first to introduce GDPR a couple of years ago. Uh, but since then, uh, things have become more complex and more fragmented. Uh, for example, in Americas, you have CCPA, you have LGPD, uh, different compli regulatory compliances. And on top of that, in APAC, we have different compliances from Australia to Singapore to Thailand, where they want to comply to different PDPA articles or uh, controls, right, to govern and to manage the data of their citizens. Most of these regulations control not only the processing of the data, but also the cross-border transform of the data. Right? For example, storing uh, or accessing uh, the data about a Singapore or Thai resident from US is restricted under the PDPA Act or protection of personal information. So to build the scope of your privacy programs, uh, it is important to clearly understand what data do you have, whether it is PI data or not, and whom data it belongs to. For, for example, if the PI data is about your citizens. So where do we store this data as well as the location from where we can access this data? So these are some of the challenges that we need to address for the different regulatory compliances. Okay. Now, uh, the road to data privacy basically has a lot of pitfalls. So to start with, uh, you have different pitfalls in terms uh, of your uh, uh, road to data protection. So 98% uh, of companies have a GDPR charter uh, accessible on their website, right? which explains that uh, the GDPR policy and how to submit those access requests. And this definitely indicates that all those companies have a GDPR project in the pipeline, probably assigned a DPO, etc. Right? Uh, but they don't deliver on their engagement, and this is an operational problem rather than a process or the business problem. Right? When, a when as a customer, one follows the procedure indicated by the charter, only 45% of the companies respond correctly within the legal deadline of 30 days. And of course, this legal deadline depends country to country. So some of the countries, they have this deadline of within uh, four weeks or within a couple of months as well. And even those who respond on time as far put, uh, from are far from uh, perfection, right? Uh, it takes them an average of 16 days to meet a demand, which from the customer's point of view is the digital age. Why, why these challenges are very hard, right? So there are some of the challenges because of the lack of the agility. So there are a lot of long and manual procedures that are unsuitable for digital life. And on top of that, you have lack of reliability. So it is most difficult to constantly monitor all the existing as well as future data source systems and to manage those in terms of governance, like which particular user or a group of users are accessing what particular applications. So it is very difficult to control the access of all those applications. And most of the times what we have seen is these different governance initiatives are not customer centric. Okay. So when it comes to talent, how talents uh, platform will help you in your enterprise digital journey to handle those different governance use cases. So the business outcome for different uh, personas of users like your CEOs, CDOs, your uh, consumers of the data uh, have different requirements. So for example, you have financial, volumetric or risk dashboards that are required for monthly or uh, weekly or daily financial reporting. And on top of that, you may also run to, uh, like to run different campaigns to cross sell, upsell of your banking products to your end customers. And in addition to that, you would also like to reduce the customer churn when it comes to the subscription of the banking accounts. In this particular webinar, we will focus uh, our use cases on risk and compliance. So uh, like we saw in the previous uh, couple of slides that you have different business use cases and each and every use case has different data requirements. And this is where the talent data fabric will help you to collect all this data in a proper manner as well as to govern the data from the time the data is ingested into the system, how the data is curated and how the data is accessed, right? So all this process can be governed from the talent data fabric product suite. 
and the platform also helps you to transform the data as well as to share the data across different business verticals. And this helps you to go from data chaos state to an absolute clarity state. To introduce, uh, in this particular session, we will be focusing on Talent Data Catalog, which is the module uh, which helps you to analyze and implement different governance use cases. So Talent Data Catalog helps you to create a single source of trusted data. It can intelligently and automatically discover all your data endpoints as well as orchestrate the data curation by different uh, users of the data. So for example, for this application, you may be having your business users, you may be having your uh, BI developers, your data engineers, as well as your uh, CIOs uh, and, and so on and so forth. So all those different personas of users can be involved in the data curation process. And within a few clicks, you will be able to search and go to a specific and a right data set. In terms of features and capabilities, the tool provides you an automated data crawling capability. The, the access is based on the role and the tool can also integrate with your centralized LDAP or AD uh, uh, tool for uh, uh, centralized authorization and access of the applications. The tool also provides you an end-to-end -end lineage and metadata documentation automatically. Mm -hmm. And in terms of connectivity, we provide built-in out-of-the-box bridges to connect to different endpoints and harvest the metadata automatically from all those source systems. So now let's move on to the demo. And before I move on to the demo, let me uh, cover a few points that I'm covering in the demo. Okay. So for any data governance policies, uh, data governance initiative, you have different policies and controls. So for example, uh, in, the, in terms of regulations, you have different regulations like Australia Privacy Act, you have Singapore PDPA, you have Thailand PDPA Act, right? So these are different regulations that uh, BFSI industry or uh, any other industry would like to comply to. And for each and every uh, Privacy Act, there are certain policies and certain controls that you have to comply to, to make sure that you are uh, regulatory compliant. So for example, in case of uh, Singapore uh, Personal uh, Data Protection Act, you want to collect, process, keep, use, as well as disclose of your personal data. So everything needs to be governed when it comes to your personal data of a particular uh, citizen of your country, right? Similarly, for the Thailand Personal Data Protection Act, you want to understand the data lineage for sensitive data within the enterprise and extending to the third parties so that they can have those lineage and take the corrective actions. So for example, in case of banks, right? So you have centralized banks or centralized regulatory banks who wants to basically capture these reports, these data lineage reports to understand how the data is flowing from different applications, right? Uh, within the bank and how it is being used and utilized by different uh, personas of users within the bank or outside the bank. Uh, in this particular demo, we will be focusing on different articles, for example, GDPR Article 9, where we will see how we can automatically identify and categorize the different uh, attributes, the critical data elements, right, automatically. And on top of that, how we can mask the data within the tool itself and how we can also grant access to a specific user on a specific data set. And of course, data lineage will also be covered in this session where we will see how the data basically, what are the source applications or the source of the data from where it is coming in, right? These are some of the use cases that we'll be discussing in the demo. And on top of that, so this is uh, the enterprise architecture that we will be discussing in the uh, demo. And I will discuss and uh, discuss more deep into this architecture in the demo itself. And last but not the least, the data provisioning request. And this is also very important when you want to control the access of a specific data set, how a particular data can be accessed and how it is governed, right? So for example, within the data catalog tool, the user will be able to search for a specific data set. Once the data set is searched, the user will, or will easily request for a data. Then based on his or her privileges, the request will go to a data stewardship process, which has also a workflow mechanism built in. Based on the request, the data owners or the stewards will approve those requests. 
And once the uh, request is approved, the data will be shared by the respective user in the talents data preparation application. And of course, in this case, you can always customize the portal. So uh, in this demo, we are using our internal portal, but in case of uh, customers or in case of uh, yourself, we can always integrate the portal uh, to be used as uh, in your inside ticketing system or a Jira kind of a tool, okay? Now let's move on to the demo and uh, I will share my screen now. Okay, so now I am sharing my screen. And let me refresh my page. Okay, so this is uh, the home page of Talent Data Catalog. So in this case, I am I have logged in as an administrator user. That means I have access to all the assets that are harvested and available inside the specific configuration. So on the top right hand side, you can see we have connected to an enterprise architecture configuration. So let's say if I am an enterprise architect and if I want to access and if I want to understand what all applications or systems are available within my bank. So to understand and see the systems, I can simply click on enterprise architecture. Okay. Once I click on enterprise architecture, I will be able to see different objects here. So I have in the in terms of data lake, I have my data lake data coming in a raw file formats, which is customer data as well as data lake data coming from my mainframe systems. Then on the below, we have an operational data stores, which is ODS layer. Again, this layer can comprise of your Oracle databases, SQL Server, IBM DB2, Postgres SQL, MySQL, and so on and so forth. On the bottom, we can see we have different data integration processes, right? So in this, we have processes, and this is your classical uh, ETL processes, where you have your uh, talent data integration jobs, your Informatica jobs, your Microsoft SSI jobs, and so on and so forth, right? And, and then subsequently, we have a data warehouse, okay? In this data warehouse, again, we can use different uh, systems, like your, uh, if you are using cloud applications, so we can have Azure data warehouse, we can have AWS Redshift, and on top of that, you can always have your traditional and most commonly used data warehouses like Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, and so on and so forth. And on top of that, there are data marts which are built on top of the data warehouse. And in terms of business intelligence, we have a couple of Tableau reports which are connected to our dimensional data warehouse. And on the top, we have business glossaries, right? So this is where you can define different business terms. So as a user, as an enterprise architect, now I can see what all systems are available within my enterprise. And if I want to further drill down and go to a column level or to a table level, I can simply double click to a specific object, right? But in this case, let's say if I'm a business user or if I'm a uh, C-level executive and I'm, I'm seeing a specific Tableau report, and in that report, I am seeing a, 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 a discrepancy in terms of my sales figures, right? So there is there's, there are some sales figures which are not correct. So from a C-level executive, how can I easily use the application to understand the data flow, how the data, how the report is basically getting generated, and what is the source of my data reports? So in this case, what I will do as an executive, right? I can simply search for a particular column. So I will simply write invoice. Let's say invoice and press enter. And once I do that, the application will scan all the information within the tool and give you the results. But now in this case, I want to respect my searching criteria within the reports. So I can simply filter the remaining part and choose W here. And once I do that, I can see here, now there's a column called invoice amount measure inside my W report, which is again certified. So from a different user perspective, you can always do social curation, where you can certify the uh, fields, you can also send warnings, and you can always rate the ratings of your particular major or object. So in this case, I will simply click on invoice amount. And once I click on the invoice amount, here I can see the business description of the major as well as any comment. 
And on the right-hand side, I can see different attributes, right? From the name, business name, any term which is which it is tagged to, physical name, as well as data type and modified. And of course, we can add additional attributes here as part of the business requirement. Now, if I want to understand the data or how the data is being computed or ingested, I will simply have to click on data flow. And once I do that, I can see that this is a uh, invoice amount major in my Tableau Finance Report 2, right? And the source of this particular column is basically a data which is coming from my accounting database table. And the column and the table name is invoice, and the column name is invoice amount. So this is how I can easily get to the source from my within a few clicks. Okay. And uh, of course, I can highlight this one. And uh, in this case, uh, from a business standpoint, now if I see, then this is the source. And now because of the rules that I have applied, there are some challenges. And I, I have to update the invoice amount column, right? So this is where the involvement of ETA developers or the database developers are also important, right? And for those set of users, they will now simply follow the same steps and go to this data lineage. So for example, now let's say if I'm an ETA developer or I'm a database developer, I can simply go to the invoice amount. That means I have to change the precision of the column. So for example, the precision of this invoice amount column is let's say 0.2, but I want to make it 0.5 or 0.6 so that the sales figure or the column is, or the numbers are correct as per the business, right? This is where I have to make sure that I need to make the changes inside my invoice amount column inside my database. Right? And also the changes should also be replicated to the downstream applications from my staging layer to my dimensional layer, as well as to, and to the changes that I have to do in my Tableau reports. But in this case, there may be a possibility where this particular column is dependent on some, uh, some other columns as well. This is where from a database developer or from an ETA developer standpoint, you can also understand and address the impact of the changes that you would like to do in this particular column. And again, within few clicks, you can address those issues. So for example, if I click on the invoice amount column and click on trace data impact, now I can see that this particular column is not only connected to this invoice amount, but it is also connected to a different object inside my data warehouse, right? So that means I have to make changes on all these applications, like from my staging layer to my data and to my dimensional layer, as well as, as well as to all the reports that are using this particular invoice amount column, right? And just imagine if you have to perform all these steps manually, it is very time consuming and you will definitely miss certain objects on which you want to make the changes, okay? This is how within a few places you can easily understand the impact of the changes that you want to do in your source applications. Now, this is from the database developer standpoint. Now from a business standpoint, let's say if I don't want or if I don't understand that there's a column called invoice amount, then again, I can simply search the invoice from a business standpoint. So for example, if I click here on the search panel and click invoice, and press enter. Now again, I would like to restrict my searching criteria from a glossary standpoint, because now I'm coming from a business uh, standpoint, right? So here I will click on uh, uh, glossary and restrict my searching criteria. And here I can see there are different business terms. So this is where I will simply click on, let's say invoice amount, right? In this case, the invoice amount basically is a business term, and that this is the business definition of this invoice amount, as well as the relationships that defines how this particular invoice amount is connected to different uh, different objects, right? So to understand what are the technical attributes that are connected to my business term, I will simply have to click on semantic flow. And once I click on semantic flow and diagram, I can see that there is a terminology called invoice amount. And this particular invoice amount is tagged to different 
downstream applications. So for example, there's a column called invoice amount in customer PO invoice amount database table, which is tagged as invoice amount, okay? So this is how you can easily go from a business side to the technical side. Now from a business standpoint, I can understand this is the business definition, which is invoice amount. And this is how the invoice amount is being used inside my architecture or inside my data flow, okay? This is how we can do that. Now, coming back to the automation, right? So in this case, let me go back to the architecture, right? So this is where you can see the entire ent enterprise architecture. But now let's say from a business standpoint, I want to restrict the access of a specific user to a specific configuration, right? So this is where the tool also provides you capabilities to create multiple configurations, right? So in this case, as an administrator, I have access to the enterprise architecture where I can access all the objects that are harvested in the application. But let's say if I want to restrict, I can simply change the configuration to a different configuration. So for example, if I click on this GDPR configuration and now go back to my enterprise architecture, here I can see now I have a limited access to the objects, right? So as a business user, I can only access the data which is coming from my FTP servers and then the ETL jobs which are processing this data and loading it into my customer staging as well as my customer data warehouse database tables, right? And then there's a business glossary on top of that. Now, the next step was the how we can address different data privacy classifications and challenges and how we can automatically identify the PII data set. So in this case, I already have a database, a table. Now, once I click on this particular automatic tagging PI database table, I will go to the database itself. The database name is data warehouse. And inside this data warehouse, I have a schema called DBO. Okay? And inside this schema, I have one table called customer prepared. So once I click on customer prepared table, I can see different uh, options here. I can see all the columns, data types, length, scale, whether it is nullable or not, right? And if I click on the columns here, I can also see different uh, options here, right? For example, statistics, histogram, semantic types, business information, as well as business name inferred original, right? Now, in this case, I if I click on data sample, there is no sample of the data here. So now as a part of the automatic uh, tagging of an identification of the PI information, what I will do is I will simply click here and generate the data sampling and profiling information. So once I click here and choose the data sample, so for example, in this case, let me choose 200 sample, filing 1000 and click on OK, the tool will automatically scan the underlying layer database table, profile it, and provide me the information, like which column is the PIA column and how this column is connected to a different business terms. And all this process is automatic. And at any point in time, from a user perspective, you don't have to do these actions manually. So now you can see here, we have different column names, which is your customer key, customer ID, first name, last name, customer identity number, right? And in this case, the tool has automatically scanned in and recommended a semantic type. So this customer identity number is an RIC number, and this belongs to a PII category in terms of classification, right? And subsequently, there is a business term which is called an RIC, which is automatically connected to my customer identity number, okay? Now, if I further click on the customer identity number, I can see different informations, like for example, I can see the inferred data types of string. On top of that, I can also see the frequency and some data profiling statistics. And this is again, very important from a business standpoint where the business users would like to understand the data, right? And now here you have a business description, which is again coming in automatically from the semantic type. And then you have PII and NRIC. Now, in this case, from a business standpoint, if I want to understand the data flow, I can simply click on data flow, right? But if I want to understand how this particular uh, customer identity number is tagged, so for that, I will simply click on semantic flow 
and diagram. Okay. Now in the diagram, I can see that this particular customer identity number, right, which is my actual technical object coming from my database table, is tagged to a NRIC business term. And this NRIC business term is basically is the PIA term, which is a restricted term in terms of user access. And on top of that, this NRIC is also a confidential term. So this is how you can also create data taxonomies to create different layers or different classifications to identify and to define your business terms. So for example, if I want to see what are the, what are the restricted terms that are available within the system, so I can simply click on restricted here and click on semantic flow. If I go to the diagram, here I can see I have a privacy classification which is restricted, right? And this restricted is tagged to PII and all these columns basically are my restricted columns. And this is how these columns are connected to different database tables, right? At a column level. So this is how you can easily identify all your restricted columns as well as all your PI information within a few clicks, okay? So this is where we can address and see those things. Now, let me go back to the previous state, which is my customer identity number, okay? And now I will go back to my table. So in this table, since I have logged in as an administrator, right? If I click on the data sample, I will be able to see all the data set, but all the columns which are, uh, highlighted as yellow color, these columns are automatically tagged or automatically hidden as a part of the profiling steps, right? Now, since I'm an administrator, I have access to all the data side, but now let's see how a business user will have a look, right? And how the business user can see these data sets. So now I will log out and log in as a business user. Okay, so let me log out and log in as a business user. If I go back to my home page, here I can see a different home page, right? So this is where the tool also provides you the capability to create and customize your home page based on the user personas. So for example, in this case, I'm a business user. I can see my company and I also have an access to the enterprise architecture where I can see but all applications I have access to. And on top of that, if I want to understand the grocery statistics, I can simply click on grocery statistics, right? And once I click on this one, I can simply see the statistics of the grocery, okay? And on top of that, you can see different classifications. Like for the grocery classifications, you have customer domain, you have the privacy classification, as well as you have PII business categories, right? And there are certain different uh, dashboards that we have created, like how, how many certified terms are available, and how many non-certified terms are available. What are the objects that are tagged as PI information, data expiration, as well as the all the PI columns which are tagged as PI data sets. So this is where you can have a summary of your assets within the home page. Now, let me go to the SK customer prepared data set, okay? Once I go here and click on the data sample, now here I can see the columns which is customer identification, birth rate, gender, home number, home mobile number. So all these columns basically are hidden, right? And as a business user, I cannot access these columns. Now, the tool also provides you capability to integrate with different reporting tools. So for example, in terms of data quality, if you also want to understand the data quality of your specific data object, you can also do that, right? So for example, uh, if I click on view trust score, okay, this will take me to a different uh, uh, application. So let me log in into the application first, uh, because it because this is where we can also control the access. You need to provide your credentials to log in the application and access those data assets to which you have access to, right? So in this case, I will log in into my portal, and then I will again click on the view trust score. So once I click on the trust score, the, 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 this will automatically uh, take me to my uh, data asset. And here I can basically access the data 
to which I want to control right, and see the data asset. So for example, in this case, I'm using the customer prepared data set. So this is where you can see the trust score of your data sets automatically. And again, every process is governed. So you need to provide the respective credentials. And if the based on the credentials, if you have an access to a specific data sets, you will be able to see the data quality of it. If no, then as a user, you will not be able to access the data set. Now, let's say if you don't have an access to a particular data set. So in this case, as a user, you can simply submit a request to access your data. So in this case, I will click on submit request. And once I click on submit request, it will take me to a portal. And of course, this portal can be your internal Jira, which we can integrate with our talent data catalog. Here, as a business user, I will provide some information, like Siddharth, Putnala, and the email address. Okay. So once I provide my details here and click on Summit and press OK, then that this information will automatically uh, go to a talent data stewardship application. Okay. Now let me reshare my screen and take you to the talent data stewardship application. Uh, let me reshare the screen again. Now, in this case, now the request has been submitted and sent for the data owners or the data stewards for the approval process, right? And in this case, as a data steward, now what I have to do is I will log in on a data owner. I will log in into the talent data stewardship application. Okay. So in this case, let me refresh the page and log in again. User. And once I will log in, I can go to the task that is assigned to me for the approval, right? So in this case, I am going to the data provision workflow management task, click on this. And as a data steward, I can simply see the request here. Request made by Siddharth, email address, and the schema and the data set name on which the user wants to have access to. Once I see the information relevant and uh, validated, I will simply validate the information and send it to the for the approval. Now, in this case, the approval has to be done by the data owner or the business who basically shares this data to you. In this case, since I am both the data steward as well as the approver, I will go to the to validate state and approve the changes made by the data steward. Okay. I will simply click on accept and validate. And once I do that, then automatically this data will be published to the talents data preparation application, right? And the users then can use their credentials to access the data automatically, okay? Now I will again stop sharing my screen and log in using a different portal, okay? Because now I need to log in and use my credentials. So let me open up. Now, once the request has been granted, then the, the users will basically, let me just give one minute. Uh, let me reshare the screen again. Okay. So now I will go to my data storage, uh, data preparation application. So I will simply log in to the application. Okay. And then go to data preparation. And once I go to the data preparation application and click on the data sets, here I can see the latest data set, which is public SK customer, right? And this is the one that my business user has uh, requested which is nothing but myself, Siddharth Kotala at talent.com. And using my credentials, I have logged in into my portal. And once I click on this data, I will again be able to see the data itself here. Okay. So this is how you can automate 
and have uh, the entire process and see how as a user we can uh, how as a user or how as we can comply to different uh, governance requirements for example identification of api information automatic tagging as well as to provide a governed access to a specific data sets